Chapter Thirteen of Gladiator. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gladiator by Philip Wiley. Chapter Thirteen. At Blazoncourt, it was spring again. The war was nearly a year old. Blazoncourt was now a street of houses, ghosts of rubble and dirt populated by soldiers a little new grass sprouted peevishly here and there an occasional house retained enough of its original shape to harbor an industry captain croan his arm in a sling was looking over a heap of debris with the aid of field glasses i see him he said pointing to a place on the boiling field where an apparent lump of soil had detached itself he rises he goes on he takes one of his mighty leaps. Ah, God, if I only had a company of such men. His aide squatted nearby, muttered something under his breath. The captain spoke again. He is very near their infernal little gun now. He has taken his rope. Ah, he spins it in the air. It falls. They are astonished. They rise up in the trench. Quick, Fidre, give me a rifle. The rifle barked sharply four, five times. Its bullet found a mark. And then another. Ah, two of them. And M. Danner now has his rope on that pig's breath. It comes up. See? He has taken it under his arm. They're shooting their machine guns. He drops into a shell hole. He's been hit, but he's laughing at them. He leaps. Look out, Fidri. Hugo landed behind the debris with a small German trench mortar in his arms. He set it on the floor. The captain opened his mouth, and Hugo waved to him to be silent. Deliberately, Hugo looked over the rickety parapet of loose stones. He elevated the muzzle of the gun and drew back the lanyard. The captain, grinning, watched through his glasses. The gun roared. Its shell exploded presently on the brow of the enemy trench, tossing up a column of smoke and earth. I should have brought some ammunition with me, Hugo said. Captain Croan stared at the little gun. Pig, he said, son of a pig. Five of my men are in your little belly. Bah! He kicked it. Summer in Axu Divash. A tall Englishman addressing Captain Croan. His voice was irritated by the heat. Is it true that you French have an Indian scout here who can bash in those mini-verfers? Pardon, mon colonel, mais je ne comprends pas l'anglais. He began again in bad French. Captain Croan smiled. Ah! You are troubled there on your sector. You wish to borrow our astonishing soldier. It will be a pleasure, I assure you. A hot, calm night. The sky pinpricked with stars. The air redolent with a mushy flavor of dead meat. So strong it left a taste in your mouth. So strong that food and water tasted like faintly chlorinated putrescence. Hugo, his blue uniform darker with perspiration, tramped through the blackness to a dugout, fifteen minutes in candlelight with a man who spoke English in an odd manner. They've been raising bloody hell with us from a point about there, the tap of a pencil. We've got little enough confidence in you, God knows. Thank you. Don't be huffy. We're obliged to your captain for the loan of you, but we've lost too many trying to take that place ourselves not to be fed up with it. I suppose you'll want a raiding party. No, thanks. But, cripes, you can't make it out there alone. I can do it, Hugo smiled. And you've lost so many of your own men. Very well. Otto Meyer pushed his helmet back on his sandy-haired head and gasped in the feverish air. A non-commissioned officer passing behind him shoved the helmet over his eyes with a muttered word of caution. Otto shrugged. Half a dozen men lounged nearby. Beside and above them were the muzzles of four squat guns and the irregular silhouette of a heap of ammunition. Two of the men rolled onto their backs and panted. I wish, one said in a soft voice, that I was back in the Hofbrau at Munich with a tall stein of beer, with that fat Fräulein that kissed me on the Potsdam station last September, sitting at my side and the orchestra playing. Otto flung a clod of dank earth at the speaker. There were chuckles from the shadows that sucked in and exhaled the rancid air. Outside the pit in which they lay, there was a gentle thud. 
Otto scrambled into a sitting posture. What is that? Nothing. Even these damned English aren't low enough to fight us in this weather. You can never tell at night in the first battle of— Listen. The thud was repeated much closer. It was an ominous sound, like the drop of a sack of earth from a great height. Otto picked up a gun. He was a man who perspired freely, and now, in that single minute, his face trickled. He pointed the gun into the air and pulled the trigger. It kicked back and jarred his arm. In the glaring light that followed, six men peered through the spiderweb of the wire. They saw nothing. You see? Their eyes smarted with the light and dark, so swiftly exchanged. Came a thud in their midst, a great thud, that spattered the dirt in all directions. Something has fallen. A shell. It's a dud. The men rose and tried to run. Otto had regained his vision and saw the object that had descended. A package of yellow sticks tied to a great mass of iron wired to it. Instead of running, he grasped it. His strength was not enough to lift it. And then for one short eternity he saw a sizzling spark move toward the sticks. He clutched at it. Help! The guns must be saved! A bomb! He knew his arm surrounded death. I cannot— his feeble voice was blown to the four winds at that instant. A terrible explosion burst from him, shattering the escaping men, blasting the howitzers into fragments, enlarging the pit to enormous dimensions. Both fronts crattered with machine-gun fire. Flares lit the terrain. Hugo, running as if with seven-league boots, was thrown on his face by the concussion. Winter. Mud a light fall of snow that was split into festers by the guns before it could anneal the ancient sores. Hugo shivered and stared into no man's land, whence a groan had issued for twenty hours, audible occasionally over the tumult of the artillery. He saw German eyes turn mutely on the same heap of rags that moved pitifully over the snow, leaving a red wake, dragging a bloody thing behind. It rose and fell moving parallel to the two trenches. Many machine-gun bullets had either missed it or increased its crimson torment. Hugo went out and killed the heap of rags with a revolver that cracked until the groan stopped into a low moan. Breaths on both sides were baited. The rags had been gray-green. A shout of low, rumbling praise came from the silent enemy trenches. Hugo looked over there for a moment and smiled. He looked down at the thing and vomited. The guns began again. Another winter. Time had become stagnant. All about it was a pool of mud and suppuration, and shot through it was the sound of guns and the scent of women, the taste of wine and the touch of cold flesh. Somewhere, he could not remember distinctly where, Hugo had a clean uniform, a portfolio of papers, a jewel case of medals. He was a great man, a man feared, the Colorado in the Foreign Legion. Men would talk about what they had seen him accomplish all through the next fifty years, at watering places in the Sahara, at the crackling fires of country house parties in Shropshire, on the shores of the South Seas, or on the moon, maybe. Old men at the last would clear the phlegm from their skinny throats and begin, When I was a fightin' with the Legion in my youngest days, there was a fellow in our company that came from some place in wild America that I disrecollect, and younger, more sanguine men would listen and shake their heads and wish there was a war for them to fight. Hugo was not satisfied with that. Still, he could see no decent exit and contrive no better use for himself. He clung frantically to the ideals he had taken with him and to the splendid purpose with which he had emblazoned his mad lust to enlist. Marseille and the sentiment it had inspired seemed very far away. He thought about it as he walked toward the front, his head bent into the gale and his helmet pitched to protect his eyes from the sting of the rain. That night he slept with Shane, a lieutenant now, twice wounded, thrice decorated, and like Hugo, thinner than he had been, older, with eyes grown bleak and seldom vehement. He resembled his lean Yankee ancestors after their exhausting campaigns of the wilderness, alive and sentient only through a sheer stubbornness that brooked neither element nor disaster. Only at rare moments did the slight strain of his French blood lift him from that grim posture. 
such a moment was afforded by the arrival of Hugo. Great God, Hugo, we haven't seen you in a dog's age. Other soldiers smiled and brought rusty cigarettes into the dugout where they sat and smoked. Hugo held out his hand. Been busy. Glad to see you. Yes, I know how busy you've been. Up and down the lines we hear about you, Le Colorado. Damned funny war. You'd think you weren't human or anywhere near human to hear these birds. Wish you'd tell me how you get away with it. Hasn't one nicked you yet? Not yet. God damn, got me here, he tapped his shoulder, and here, his thigh. That's tough. I guess the sort of work I do isn't calculated to be as risky as yours, Hugo said. Hm. That you can tell to Sweeney. The Frenchmen were still sitting politely, listening to a dialogue they could not understand. Hugo and Shane eyed each other in silence, a long penetrating silence. At length the latter said soberly, Still as enthusiastic as you were that night in Marseille? Are you? I didn't have much conception of what war would be then. Neither did I, Hugo responded, and I'm not very enthusiastic any more. Oh, well, exactly. Heard from your family? Sure. Well, they relapsed into silence again. By and by they ate a meal of cold food, supplemented by rank steaming coffee, and then they slept. Before dawn, Hugo woke feeling like a man in the mouth of a volcano that had commenced to erupt. The universe was shaking. The walls of the dugout were molting chunks of earth. The scream and burst of shells were constant. He heard Shane's voice above the den, issuing orders in French. The batteries were to be phoned, a protective counterfire, a barrage in readiness in case of attack, which seemed imminent. Larger shells drowned the voice. Hugo rose and stood beside Shane. Coming over? Coming over. A shapeless face spoke in the gloom. The voice panted. We must get out of here, my lieutenant. They are smashing in the dugout. A methodical scramble to the orifice. Hell was rampaging in the trench. The shells fell everywhere. Shane shook his head. It was neither light nor dark. The incessant blinding fire did not make things visible except for fragments of time and in fantastic perspectives. Things belched and boomed and smashed the earth and whistled and howled. It was impossible to see how life could exist in that cauldron. And yet men stood calmly all along the line. A few of them, here and there, were obliterated. The red sky in the southeast became redder with the rising sun. Hugo remained close to the wall. It was no novelty for him to be under shell fire. But at such times he felt the need of caution with which he could ordinarily dispense. If one of the steel cylinders found him, even his mighty frame might not contain itself. Even he might be rent asunder. Shane saw him and smiled. Twenty yards away a geyser of fire sprayed the heavens. Ten feet away a fragment of shell lashed down a pile of sandbags. Shane's smile widened. Hugo returned it. Then red fury enveloped the two men. Hugo was crushed ferociously against the wall and liberated in the same second. He fell forward, his ears singing and his head dizzy. He lay there aching. Dark red stains flowed over his face from his nose and ears. Painfully, he stood up. A soldier was watching him from a distance with alarmed eyes. Hugo stepped. He found that locomotion was possible. The bedlam increased. It brought a sort of madness. He remembered Shane. He searched in the smoking, stinking muck. He found the shoulders and part of Shane's head. He picked them up in his hands, disregarding the butchered ends of the raw gobbet. White electricity crackled in his head. He leaped to the parapet, shaking his fists. God damn you dirty sons of bitches! I'll make you pay for this! You got him! Got him, you bastards! I'll shove your filthy hides down your devil's throat and through his guts! Oh, Jesus! He did not feel the frantic tugging of his fellows. He ran into that bubbling, doom-ridden chaos, waving his arms and shouting maniacal profanities. A dozen times he was knocked down. He bled slowly where fragments had battered him. He crossed over and paused on the German parapet. He was like a being of steel. Bullets sprayed him. His arms dangled and lifted. Barbed wire trailed behind him. Down before him, shoulder to shoulder, the attacking regiments waited for the last crescendo of the bombardment. They saw him come out of the fury and smiled grimly. They knew such madness. They shot. 
He came on. At last they could hear his voice dimly through the tumult. Someone shouted that he was mad, to beware when he fell. Hugo jumped among them. Bayonets rose. Hugo wrenched three knives from their wielders in one wild clutch. His hands went out, snatching and squeezing. That was all. No weapons, no defense, just hands. Whatever they caught, they crushed flat. And heads fell into those dreadful fingers. Sides, legs, arms, bellies. Bayonets slid from his tawny skin, taking his clothes. By and by, except for his shoes, he was naked. His fingers had made a hundred bunches of clotted pulp, and then a thousand as he walked swiftly forward in that trench. Ahead of him was a file of green, behind a clogged row of writhing men. Scarcely did the occupants of each new traverse see him before they were smitten. The wounds he inflicted were monstrous. On he walked, his voice now stilled, his breath sucking and whistling through his teeth, his hands flailing and pinching and spurting red with every contact. No more formidable engine of desolation had been seen by man, no more titanic fury, no swifter and surer death. For thirty minutes he raged through that line. The men thinned. He had crossed the attacking front. Then the barrage lifted. But no whistles blew. No soldiers rose. A few raised their heads and then lay down again. Hugo stopped and went back into the abattoir. He leaped to the parapet. The French saw him silhouetted against the sky. The second German wave, coming slowly over a far hill, saw him and hesitated. No ragged line of advancing men. No cacophony of rifle fire. Only that strange, savage figure, a man dipped in scarlet, nude, dripping, panting. Slowly in that hiatus, he wheeled. His lungs thundered to the French. Come on, you black bastards. I've killed them all. Come on, we'll send them down to hell. The officers looked and understood that something phenomenal had happened. No Germans were coming. A man stood above their trench. Come quick, Hugo shouted. He saw that they did not understand. He stood an instant, fell into the trench, and presently a shower of German corpses flung through the air in wide arcs and landed on the very edge of the French position. Then they came, and Hugo, seeing them, went on alone to meet the second line. He might have forged on through that bloody swath to the heart of the Empire if his vitality had been endless. But some time in the battle... He fell unconscious on the field, and his forward-leaning comrades pushed back the startled enemy, found him lying there. They made a little knot around him, silent, quivering. It is the Colorado, someone said. His friend, Shane, it is he who was the lieutenant just killed. They shook their heads and felt a strange fear of the unconscious man. He is breathing. They called for stretcher-bearers. They faced the enemy again, bent over the stocks of their rifles, and surged forward. Hugo was washed and dressed in pajamas. His wounds had healed without the necessity of a single stitch. He was grateful for that, otherwise the surgeons might have had a surprise which would have been difficult to allay. He sat in a wheelchair, staring across a lawn. An angular woman, in an angular hat and tailored clothes, was trying to engage him in conversation. Is it very painful, my man? Hugo was seeing that trench again. The pulp and blood and hate of it. Not very. Her tongue and saliva made a noise. Don't tell me. I know it was. I know how you all bleed and suffer. Madam, it happens that my wounds were quite superficial. Nonsense, my boy. They wouldn't have brought you to a base hospital in that case. You can't fool me. I was suffering only from exhaustion. She paused. He saw a gleam in her eye. I suppose you don't like to talk about things. Poor boy, but I imagine your life has been so full of horror that it would be good for you to unburden yourself. Now tell me, just what does it feel like to bayonet a man? Hugo trembled. He controlled his voice. Madam, he replied, it feels exactly like sticking your finger into a warm steaming pile of cow dung. Oh, she gasped, and he heard her repeat it again in the corridor. End of chapter 13